Hello and welcome. Fire is a wonderful servant of man, but can be a cruel master. It is estimated from evidence at Israel's Kwasim cave that the earliest use of fire by Homo sapiens, perhaps Nathanthus as well, dates from back to 300,000 to 400,000 years. I'm sure there were burn injuries then as there are now. I am reading Professor Fiona Wood's book Under Her Skin, where she describes how skin, our largest organ, not only holds our bits together, but regulates temperature and moisture and is a barrier to bacteria, fungi and viruses. It is a vital sense organ and even exhibits our emotions, such as when we blush, shiver and sweat. It is so vulnerable to injury by fire. So, what has all this to do with flying? It was in World War II that many air crew were being brought into hospitals with terrible burn injuries. Being confined in a cockpit, surrounded by fuel tanks and explosives, whilst being shot at was bad enough. Descending whilst on fire was agony. Disfiguring injuries and loss of fingers, noses and ears, all too common. If the person survived, they were left with scars that acted as strictures. Pioneering plastic surgeon Sir Archibald McIndoe at the Queen Victoria Hospital East Grinstead gave 649 men, his so-called guinea pigs, the chance for a normal life after such disfiguring injury. McIndoe no doubt benefited from the work of his cousin, Sir Harold Gillies, who rebuilt the faces of 5,000 World War I soldiers mutilated by shrapnel and bullets. He used techniques such as pedicle skin flaps to reconstruct areas of the body such as noses. Gillies' surgical skills earned him the epithet father of plastic surgery. Bill Foxley, navigator in a Wellington bomber, tells how he got his injuries. I was the navigator in a Wellington bomber. The Wellington crashed, went up in flames, and uh, three of the crew were killed, and myself and two others survived. I was able to get out through the top of the aircraft, and uh, a bit difficult getting out through there. That's uh, why my hands got fairly badly burned, because um, by that time, the, the metal was a bit hot. Archibald McIndoe was one of only four plastic surgeons at that stage within the, within the country as a whole. And he chose East Grinstead Hospital um, to come and work. And gradually they started to learn more about how best to manage, particularly the air crew who'd had very major burns. Our injuries, hands and face, were known as Ehrman's burn because it was the exposed parts which used to get the... Um, the burns and I mean, we weren't a very pleasant sight when we were first burned. McIndoe's patients of World War II were more commonly referred to as members of the guinea pig club. They were pilots who kept Nazi Germany at bay but the price of their everyday heroism was sometimes horrific burns. McIndoe felt that these chaps were only 20, 21, 22 year old and they've got to get back into society. So he said that they've got to go out and mix so he went into the town and said, I'm going to send these chaps into the town. Don't stare at them. They got their injuries through fighting for you or through the war years. And uh, they started letting them out from the hospital to go to the two local pubs, mixing with the girls. And then the town became the town that didn't stare because nobody stared at them. They... It was Mackendo that recognised that as important as repairing physical injuries was, restoring these men's mental health and giving a safe space for them to return to society 
was also important. He enlisted the folk in a nearby village to his cause. The airmen could go for a beer at the Whitehall restaurant in East Grinstead and people wouldn't stare. Burns wards now are different from those days with options such as antibiotics, physiotherapy and protheses. The burn score still applies though. If the sum of a person's age added to the percentage of their body burnt equals 100 or more, then the chance of recovery is slim. Professor Fiona Wood describes how Valerie Sloss, a rear passenger in a Cessna 182 that crashed, sustaining burns to 85% of her body. She was 49 years of age, giving her a score of 134. She was rushed by Royal Flying Doctor to Royal Perth Hospital's burn unit. She survived. On a daily basis I see suffering and I see people respond to that suffering that in a way that is actually inspirational. Primarily uh, I'm a surgeon and so I work in the health department as the director of the burn service of Western Australia. I went to St Thomas's Hospital Medical School in uh, the University of London and that was my first exposure to the whole burn injury paradigm and how actually we could do better and how actually we could survive such severe trauma and I became obsessed with wanting to do it better. As we went along trying to improve the quality of our, our healing from burn injury, we started to understand the power of skin's regenerative capacity, how it can repair itself. And so we started looking at what can we do with the skin from the non-injured body site and change the, sort of the, the whole healing potential in the wounded site to grow the skin cell sheets to, for use in a clinical situation took three weeks. And Marie Stone and I, with the Rain Foundation and the support we had here at UWA, we were able to get that three weeks down to 10 days and then recognise that in fact, looking at the science behind what we were doing, if we used the cells as individual cells rather than the sheet, they were biologically very active on the surface. So then we took the tissue engineering, tissue regeneration to the bedside, and at the bedside we changed the surgical procedure to facilitate the two to come together. So it went from three weeks to ten days to five days to half an hour. Scar repair is very limiting. It's not just how it looks, it impacts how you move and a whole raft of things, how you internally, how your heart and your liver, your lungs work and all. So how can we reduce that? And it's, research is fundamental. Interdisciplinary research is fundamental. Places like UWA are fundamental to us actually delivering better quality healthcare, better quality science, better quality life on this planet. I would love to understand why, if I'm burnt here, do my nerves change here and my brain change here? And one day, maybe we'll know enough to be able to think ourselves whole with no scar. Wow. And I may never live to see that, but I believe it will happen at some point. So I have a fundamental belief that we learn from today to make tomorrow better. And that's how it's our duty to do that as clinicians and as researchers, but it's also our privilege because we're in a very special space. Covering burns from harvested sheets of skin from undamaged areas of the body can save a person's life. What if there isn't much undamaged skin, as in Valerie's case? Could skin be grown in a flask from whatever little there is to a size for transplantation? Professor Masterton and scientist Joanne Paddle Lednick at Monash Medical School thought so, drawing on the 1975 work of Professor Howard Green from Boston. An initial culture could be increased by 10,000 times in three to four weeks. Professor Woods sent samples to Melbourne and in a month the tissue for transplantation returned to Perth. Four weeks was time they and their patient didn't have. How could the process be sped up? Why couldn't they grow the cells here in Perth? By happenstance, Professor Woods 
and scientist Marie Stoner shared space in the medical laboratory at Royal Perth Hospital and, although on different projects, started comparing notes. With $50,000 funding in 1992 from Channel 7's Telethon, Fiona and Marie set up a skin lab in Princess Margaret Hospital. They were now producing skin in hours, not days. Rather than wait for mature cells to form, they were growing immature cells which thrived on the patient's wounds. These weren't even sheets, but a soup of cells. But how to deliver this soup to the patient's skin? They found that many of the spray bottles they trialled actually damaged the cells. Finally, they tried the nozzle from a bottle of an Italian mouth freshener. Yes, it worked. It was time to publish and share with the world. Avita Medical was founded to commercialise this clinical cell culture known as Recell and Cell Spray. How does a wound heal? Whether you have a paper cut or serious wound, skin heals from the edges of the wound inward. The skin provides a physical barrier to the outside world. When an injury occurs, the skin cells at the edge of the wound are programmed to try to close the gap by growing back together. This is known as the free edge effect. While a paper cut may heal in just a few days, patients with a moderate or severe burn may have to wait months for skin to regrow from the outside edges inward. The longer a wound remains open, the greater chance it has to become infected or for scarring to occur. Effective healing and the formation of robust skin requires the presence of keratinocytes, fibroblasts, and melanocytes as well as other factors. Keratinocytes are responsible for providing a protective barrier against the external environment. Melanocytes produce melanin and are responsible for natural pigmentation and restoration of pigmentation following injury. Fibroblasts maintain the structural integrity of connective tissues to support cellular growth. Since a serious wound cannot remain open for fear of infection, the current standard of care is a skin graft. Skin grafts are very painful, as the procedure requires the removal of healthy skin from one area of the body to treat the burn injury. The recell system is different. It is a small device that is used to prepare spray-on skin cells in the operating room from a small piece of the patient's own skin. When used to treat a burn wound, the spray-on skin cell suspension is evenly distributed across the entire wound bed, which is believed to remove the free edge effect limitation, stimulating healing from the inside out. To prepare the solution of spray-on skin cells, physicians take a small amount of healthy skin from the patient a patch of skin the size of a credit card can cover an adult patient's entire back. The healthy skin sample is processed using the recell system, and within 30 minutes, a solution of spray on skin cells is ready for use. Physicians then spray the solution of isolated skin cells, which contain keratinocytes, fibroblasts, and melanocytes, across the entire wound to stimulate healing. As a result, new tissue grows across the entire surface area of the wound. All of this is performed at the point of care. All of Fiona's skills would be tested when, in 2002, firebombing in Bali killed 200 people and injured 240. Of the 100 Australians evacuated, 28 went to Perth. 19 surgeons and 130 clinical staff worked around the clock for five days in four operating theatres coordinated by Fiona to operate on the burns and shrapnel wounds. These were terrible times. In 2007, a Garuda Indonesian flight overshot the runway into a paddy field. Cynthia Bannum saw her legs on fire, released the seatbelt and fell into the paddy water. That did put out the fire, but the polluted water left her burns badly infected, leading to a partial amputation to save her life. In 2013, Tony White and his passenger took off from Janicott in his Glass Air 3 when the engine failed. He steered for a school oval, striking a goalpost, bursting into flames. Fiona Wood's team used lasers to puncture the scars to improve elasticity. In aviation, the threat of fire is ever-present. Fast response 
by Aviation Rescue Fire Fighting Service across 27 of Australia's busiest airports promises help when aircraft come to grief. To all the people dedicated to keeping us safe, we salute you. Thank you for watching. Comments are always welcome. Please like, subscribe and hit the notify bell to encourage new content.